Hello and aloha and welcome to History 241 Civilizations of Asia Session 25 which deals with Southeast Asia from about 300 BC to 1300 AD. Uh, my name is Abdul Karim Khan and I teach here at Liverpool Community College and please uh, go to WebCT and check out uh, any assignments that might be due or any reading that you need to know. And also please, uh, you know, uh, email me if you need my help and I will try my best to get back to you. You uh, write, note down uh, my uh, latest uh, phone number so, so that we would be, you know, in contact with each other. Uh, today we are going to be uh, talking about uh, Southeast Asia and you would know why this is called Southeast Asia in a minute. Uh, we mostly covered uh, pretty much uh, South Asia first. Uh, then we moved to East Asia. South Asia was primarily, you know, uh, India and East Asia was basically um, China, the bigger piece, and then uh, uh, Japan. And now we're going to be talking about uh, Southeast Asia. So this Southeast Asia, which is also, you know, uh, so far uh, population is concerned, a huge big population in uh, Asia. And so far the area is concerned, it may not look like a huge big area, but at the same time it is. It contains a lot of people. And the greatest thing about Southeast Asia is a lot of food. Uh, which uh, everybody needs it. So that's the uh, sort of uh, the geographical significance that we would go into it. And let's see, uh, before we go into Southeast Asia, let's see what we did last time uh, on the previous uh, session, that was session 24. Okay, uh, sort of a review. Uh, last time we talked about uh, Japan under Prince Shotoko and how he wanted to bring Chinese influences, more and more influences in Japan. In fact, he wanted to turn China like an, uh, a sort of a replica of, uh, I mean, he wanted Japan to become a replica of China. Uh, also, we talked about the Nara and the, the Nara era and the changes and how Nara cha changed the Chinese institutions and beginning with the Nara period, uh, these Chinese institutions would be changed into Japanese. And then in the Heian period, most of uh, Chinese institutions, you know, were abandoned and more and more what you see would be the uh, Japanization, so to speak, of the uh, political institutions and the military as well as the agricultural techniques. And it was during the Heian period that uh, the emperor sort of, they started losing power which would remain a major factor in Japanese history in which the emperor would just reign, he would be there, but he would not be the real ruler. And so from here on period, you see the rise of what's called the shogunate. All right. Also in Japan, another major change as compared to any other country was the rule of different clans. And these clans would be the real rulers of Japan. And even, the, you know, the emperor sometime would become sort of a puppet in their hands. So we talked about uh, the different clans and their rule and how the Mongols, you know, their invasion ended a very powerful clan, Kamakura uh, clan, that ruled Japan for quite some time and how powerful that was. So that was sort of Japan and uh, we brought it down up to about uh, 1300 or the coming of the Man Mongols and finishing the Kamakura, uh, I mean weakening and then ending the Kamakura Shogunate. And now we are going to visit Southeast Asia and let's see what is there by way of introduction. All right. Uh, Southeast Asia, the uh, first and foremost, the land and the people, the geography and the population, the people. Uh, we would talk about uh, the uh, Indian and the Chinese influences in Southeast Asia and primarily how these influences define and still they do Southeast Asia. Uh, the rise of the early kingdoms in Southeast Asia, uh, the rise of religious art and architecture that is so beautiful and so, uh, I mean, characteristic of uh, ancient Southeast Asia, the religious art and architecture. 
uh, the two major kingdom and uh, you know the, the earlier kingdoms Java and Cambodia uh, we will talk about that a little bit and see the rise of the religious art and how that religious art and architecture defined Java and Cambodia so that would be in uh, in a way the uh, uh, Southeast Asian art represented Java and Cambodia and the nature of Southeast Asia, what makes Southeast Asia and what is in the future uh, for Southeast Asia. So uh, before we get into Southeast Asia, uh, for now so far the uh, ancient history or medieval history of Southeast Asia is concerned, uh, keep in mind uh, a few basic uh, you know, major features of Southeast Asia. Number one, Southeast Asia being a place known for the production of food, a lot of food. Uh, number two, Southeast Asia having a very peaceful population. Uh, those who came with, you know, with a little bit of bang or, uh, I mean, disturbance, and pretty much one day they settled in Southeast Asia, then they started focusing on uh, you know, the uh, easy lifestyle, uh, the bumper crops that they could get and did not want to leave. So Southeast Asia is one place where people came and never left and became settled permanently in Southeast Asia, uh, which made Southeast Asia compared to, uh, compared to other places in Asia a very peaceful place. And we would talk about that peaceful nature of Southeast Asia, even though you know, these days we hear a lot of, uh, I mean, uh, terroristic uh, uh, bombing and um, all those uh, problems. Uh, but that was, you know, that's the new thing uh, initiate, I mean, introduced to Southeast Asia. So let's see first uh, Southeast Asia. The geography of Southeast Asia. Uh, quite a few countries, as you would notice, would make Southeast Asia. So this is a uh, a, 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 an uh, alphabetical order uh, in which we present the countries. Brunei, although very small or the smallest of all, then Cambodia, uh, East Timor, uh, very small, uh, to compared to Indonesia, huge and big as you would see it, Laos, uh, Malaysia, Myanmar, which used to be called Burma, uh, Philippines, another major country, uh, Singapore, another small country, uh, Thailand, and Vietnam. So these countries, Brunei, Cambodia, East Timor, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, formerly known as Burma, uh, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand. Thailand used to be called Siam. Uh, Thailand and Vietnam, they constitute the overall, you know, area of Southeast Asia. All right, let's see, uh, sticking to geography, that's uh, the whole of Asia, and right there is Southeast Asia in the green, and there it goes. Right, so that's the Southeast Asia, and some people, they call it like a rice ball, you know, like a pot, you have it right there, and there is a rice in it. So some, you know, some people want to make a, a sense of the, the shape of uh, Southeast Asia. So that's how Southeast Asia is. And of course, known for a lot of uh, bumper crops of rice and uh, uh, still, you know, uh, a wonderful place. Okay, sticking with geography, uh, Southeast Asia is uh, no wonder called tropical paradise because that's what it is. It's a paradise, I mean. Uh, no question about that. Uh, it's located within the tropics and hence, uh, you know, the title or sort of uh, uh, known being, uh, you know, tropical paradise. Uh, it has a very good warm climate. You won't feel too cold there once you are there, even in December. You might feel hot if you are from, you know, a very cold area. Uh, very rich soil, by the way, very rich soil. You can grow almost anything, you know, and what is naturally available there grows naturally every time. So you won't be starved. Uh, f a lot of fresh water, that's uh, one of the great thing uh, of the richness of the land and especially the monsoon rain. They do damage sometime, you know, but not as much as, you know, the monsoon rain cause damage in East India or for that reason in Bangladesh, uh, but still, 
you know, uh, monsoon is a great gift of nature to the people of Southeast Asia. Um, natural fruits, a lot of them, and you know, you don't have to grow them, they grow and, uh, themselves and you just enjoy it. And effortless bumper crops as they're called, you know, because uh, the, the soil is very soft. It's not, uh, I mean, uh, you know, like a very tough terrain. Uh, also, it does not need um, a lot of hard work because the terrain is soft, there is a lot of water, uh, the soil does not have a lot of, uh, you know, like a hard stone that one has to deal with. However, sometime in the mud, I mean, that's just the nature of rice growing, uh, you have to have water, you know, in the field already to plow the fields and, uh, you know, to make it uh, uh, good for, uh, to prepare the fields for the rice cultivation, that is sometimes very hard, of course. And human beings, I mean, they have to utilize, they, they, they have to uh, utilize uh, the force of the animals and there comes the water buffalo, you know, the greatest force, just like uh, a, an ox would be a great force on continental area that is North China or in India where the people, most people, they use oc oxen uh, for uh, cultivation, for, uh, you know, plowing. In Southeast Asia, it's usually, you know, the water buffalo that is used for uh, uh, the uh, uh, plowing of the uh, rice paddies and preparing, I mean, you know, the uh, fields for the rice. So that, that's a sort of, you know, a little bit of geography and let's see a little bit more of still staying with the geography. Okay. Uh, Southeast Asia is divided into two main groups. One is called mainland Southeast Asia and the other is called island Southeast Asia. So let's see uh, what countries constitute mainland Southeast Asia. Myanmar, as I said, formerly called Burma. That is one uh, major country in the mainland of Southeast Asia. Thailand, another major country in on the mainland Southeast Asia, formerly known as Siam. Uh, Vietnam also uh, belongs to mainland Southeast Asia. So is Laos and uh, Cambodia. So these countries constitute mainland Southeast Asia. And right there we go. Uh, to highlight them, that is Myanmar, Thailand, Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. So these were the uh, major uh, mainland Southeast Asian uh, countries on the mainland. So they have their own character, uh, the mainland uh, people, uh, closer to both, uh, you know, sort of uh, China and closer to attach to the uh, Indian subcontinent. Uh, they have uh, their own char characteristic, uh, much more closer to India in a way, so far, uh, you know, the immigration was concerned and both would, you know, uh, mainland would have uh, its uh, also its separate nature of religion. Uh, as being uh, mainland and having more land, that would also reflect into the uh, uh, political uh, geography uh, uh, of these uh, different countries and so there you would have a much more domineering type of uh, kingdoms because of the land that they had, you know, to uh, at their disposal. So that's how there are some major characteristics separate belonging to mainland Southeast Asia and very different from the island Southeast Asia. Let's see some of uh, these uh, characteristics of uh, so, uh, mainland Southeast Asia. Mainland Southeast Asia, uh, it is home to quite a few, but major three great rivers and the deltas that, uh, you know, they create, uh, especially the Mekong. We cannot show all, you know, rivers, but the greatest of all, the Mekong River, which flows through Thailand, Laos, and Cambodia. And the, uh, uh, that, that's another, and another one, the Eravade uh, River that uh, flows into Myanmar, formerly called Burma. 
and let us see these uh, great rivers. The Mekong River, uh, you might have noticed, you know, Mekong, uh, this is uh, China right here. And since it is it's a bit uh, western part of China, southwestern part of China, the Chinese cannot use it much. And this uh, river uh, is born somewhere in Tibet. And again, you know, they're in Tibet, they cannot use it. And that's one tragedy with all the major rivers that they cannot be utilized close to their, you know, home or places of birth. So I wish, you know, the uh, Chinese could use it and the Tibetan could use it because that, that's there, you know, first uh, it comes into those nations. And Mekong, uh, I mean, a wonderful river in Southeast Asia. Some people, uh, they, they say like, uh, what uh, the Nile is to the Nile is to uh, Egypt, and the Indus is to modern-day Pakistan, or you know the two great rivers, the uh, uh, Yellow River and Yangtze River to China. The Mekong River is to Southeast Asia. So it's a huge, big, wonderful, and magnificent, and brings you know fresh water from Tibet, and uh, it's a good thing that it goes through several different uh, countries and uh, benefits almost everybody wherever it flows except as i said you know the birthplace that is tibet uh, let's see the other river that river is iravade right there and it also you know helps uh, a lot uh, when it comes to the uh, uh, burma or myanmar you know, irrigation networks, so both are wonderful. There are other, uh, other ones, and most of them, they flow from north to south, as, uh, you know, a lot of rivers they do, although uh, the uh, Egyptian river, the Nile River, is the only exception that f flows backward from south to north. But just like any other river, most of them, they flow from north to south. And so these two major rivers and other minor ones give bumper crops to the people of Southeast Asia and helps them to bring fresh water and some of that water is also used for drinking, you know, and not just for irrigation but also for human consumption. Uh, Southeast Asia does not have any problem of river. It never faced, you know, any drought, the type of which you could have on mainland like in China or in India or uh, Europe or anywhere else like Africa. So that's why Southeast Asia is so blessed, you know, with the water resources and why, you know, water is a great resource, especially the fresh water, you know, from the mountains and from the springs and from the rain that the people of Southeast Asia enjoy. Let's see uh, further the geography of Southeast Asia. Uh, now the islands of Southeast Asia, uh, Malaysia, uh, you know, one island, uh, then Indonesia, uh, Philippines, Singapore, although a little tiny country, but still very important country so far, you know, economy is concerned. Brunei, also very rich, or rather the richest of all, you know, for that small place as it is, you would see it. And East Timor, it's a, you know, late, um, just so recently it came into being separated from uh, Indonesia, East Timor. So these would constitute the uh, uh, islands of uh, Southeast Asia. Let's see them. Let's see, there is Malaysia. And there is Indonesia, right? And huge and big. There is Philippines. Now, Singapore, a little tiny place, but very important. So for, you know, economy money is concerned, technology. Singapore, Brunei, another very rich, small place. Geographically small, but very rich because of oil. And then there is East Timor. East Timor was uh, just so recently separated from Indonesia and it became uh, an independent sovereign country and uh, also became, you know, like the latest uh, member of United Nations. Uh, okay, the largest islands of uh, Southeast Asia. 
Indonesia, of course. And the size of Indonesia, you know, uh, it, it is about one quarter of United States of America, continental uh, America. Uh, however, when the extended uh, area of uh, Indonesia is equal to that of entire United States of America, if you were to go from the east coast of Indonesia to the west coast of Indonesia, that would be to go from New York to uh, California. You know, that's the whole size. So, uh, you know, it takes uh, about uh, uh, six hours, you know, flight or whatever the duration of flight would be between east coast and west coast of United States. So is the duration of flight between uh, the east and the south, uh, west coast of uh, uh, Indonesia. Uh, a strange, uh, you know, uh, factor about the, uh, there it is, you know, uh, Indonesia. From here to here, you know, it makes the entire continental size of United States of America. That's what it means. All right. Southeast Asia, uh, other larger islands, uh, Philippines, you know, uh, the lar larger than uh, Arizona, state of Arizona, Luzon and Mindanao, Luzon in the north and Mindanao in the south, uh, give the country the, the largest islands. There it is, Philippines. And the northern part, this is Luzon, and the southern part is uh, Mindanao. And because Mindanao is so close to Indonesia and Malaysia, that is why Mindanao uh, is very Islamic, predominantly Muslim uh, area in Philippines. All right. So th these were some of the you know features of uh, the, the geographic features of Southeast Asia. How you know geographer they divide Southeast Asia into mainland as well as into islands of Southeast Asia, and each one, each group, mainland and South, uh, the island Southeast Asia, having their own characteristics. Uh, one having the mainland having much more interaction with the people of China and India and the island people a little bit, you know, uh, away from the two major countries of China and India. Let's see further. Uh, still, in the geography of Southeast Asia, one characteristic of Southeast Asia is away from continents. Continents like uh, the uh, China and India the Asian part of continent, uh, the also from Africa and Europe, away from these continents, uh, away from main uh, main uh, travel routes like the Silk Road, you know, or uh, the uh, road that could be used between China and Rome in the north, or the road that could be used from uh, uh, Alexandria. Uh, Egypt, you know, down south of uh, Arabia. So it is a, uh, Southeast Asia being away from continents and away from main traveling routes, uh, like uh, the Silk Road, as I said, uh, that had its own impact. Uh, there is minor ra uh, racial diversity in Southeast Asia. Uh, think about it, if all these people were, you know, if Southeast Asia was close to the Asian, African, and European continent, there would have been a lot of racial diversity, but Southeast Asia is known for less racial diversity, which also with that less racial diversity comes less racial friction. So there is not much, uh, you know, uh, like a problem uh, among the people of uh, Southeast Asia. Uh, just like you, you know, in history, unfortunately, we have a, uh, fighting, wars, even massacres of one group by another group, you know, uh, on the mainland of Asia, in China as well as in India, you know, in Europe and Africa, that type of a massacres of people you won't experience in the history of uh, Southeast Asia, whether mainland as well as, uh, you know, island. There have been warfare, no question about that, especially in the beginning as these people were coming together and seizing land and, you know, protecting themselves from another Im uh, wave of Im immigrants. So in the beginning there were troubles, but later on you don't have that type of, you know, problems. Uh, under, I mean, until the late uh, uh, period uh, when foreign influences would increase in Southeast Asia, with the foreign influences, especially religious influences, 
there, then you would see trouble for the people uh, in Southeast Asia. Let's see further. Still staying with the geography. Um, Southeast Asia had its own ancient sea routes within Southeast Asia internally. And those routes work, you know, for internal communication of travel and trade, much more coming and going between the people of Southeast Asia, which was good for understanding, reaching out to each other. Uh, these uh, uh, sea routes also gave the people of Southeast Asia access to external regions, particularly to India, uh, Southeast, especially Southeast India and South China. So they could easily communicate and go back and forth uh, between Southeast Asia and Southeast India and South China. And that's how, you know, India and China have two major influences. Uh, also, the Southeast Asian people having done a lot of communication, travel, trade, you know, with, uh, with the East African people and the Polynesian people. So, uh, the people of Southeast Asia, despite the fact, geographical fact that they are, uh, they were or still are away from uh, continents, you know, Asia, Europe, and Africa, but still they have been, you know, going and coming and having interaction with the people of especially uh, China, India, and East Africa, and later on, beginning with the 16th century, after 1500, more and more European would, you know, visit them in the grand theme of uh, European discovery and colonization and conquest. Southeast Asia would suffer as much at the hands of European people. It would be colonized to almost all of these people. It would be colonized by the European people as the European colonized people in India, uh, you know, in, uh, on the uh, continents of America, North and South Central America. Similarly, the people were colonized, the European colonized people in Africa. So the same fate, you know, the people of Southeast Asia would also suffer. Uh, but still, there would not be as many massacres as they were in different other places, uh, but not in Southeast Asia. And that made Southeast Asia uh, like a very peaceful place. Let's see further. The geographical environmental conditions sustained, you know, perfect geographical, environmental conditions sustained peaceful, large populations, you know, again, a major factor of geography. Uh, it also, the geography could sustain great kingdoms, especially on mainland, and petty principalities of powerful, you know, rulers in the islands of Southeast Asia. Uh, the Southeast Asian people stayed at home because, you know, they really never felt the need to leave their home and go somewhere else. And it's always, you know, p other people, the outsiders, came to Southeast Asia. And again, that was because of the geography of Southeast Asia. So if the people of Southeast Asia, if they had everything at home, bumper crops, you know, a lot of fruits, uh, different spices, you know, the whole wealth of life, if they had it, why should they go, you know, somewhere else? Why they should go and conquer other places? Uh, they were limited, you know, in the scope of that. I mean, they, they could not, I mean, go and conquer China or India for that reason, Africa or Europe. Uh, but st still, you know, because they were very peaceful, they had the abundance, you know, of their own paradise, everything inside their home that kept within, inside the home, less friction. People did not fight as much as they fought in China, India, Europe, and Africa because they had everything. That's one. Second thing is they did not leave their home to go anywhere else because they had everything, as I said, at home. But at the same time, that, just that factor brought a lot of people from outside, a lot of Chinese, a lot of Indians, and later on, finally, you know, the Europeans who came and grabbed everybody right in their own home. So that, that was sort of a, you know, uh, minus or negative feature of the geography that brought attracted outside people, especially the Europeans who came and, you know, to discover and not only they discovered, but they took it over, colonized, you know, Southeast Asia. All right, let's go further. The peoples of Southeast Asia. Uh, the dominant group 
is called the Malay group in Southeast Asia. Uh, that's the most dominant group in Southeast Asia, the Malay group. That group is also mixed with the indigenous minor groups uh, in Southeast Asia, both mainland as well as uh, island. And these uh, indigenous groups would be like the Mon Khmer uh, group of people, the Tibetan Burmese people, uh, and the Polynesian people. Uh, these were uh, minor indigenous people and they were mixed up with the Malay group of people. So you have a lot of mixture in Southeast Asia. Immigrants that came from outside, for example, like uh, from Burma or Myanmar, the modern day name is Myanmar, as I said, and from India and from China. So most immigrants came from Myanmar, India, and China, and mixed up with the indigenous people, and especially with the Malay group of people. Uh, again, keep in mind, the racial friction is uh, very less. Uh, there are not many massacres or major fighting among these people, which was a good thing. All right, uh, let's see the immigrant groups from Myanmar and India. Uh, mostly the Indian group of people. They came in the 4th and the 3rd centuries BC, one of the earliest groups that uh, came from outside, especially from modern day Myanmar uh, and India in the 4th and the 3rd centuries BC. And they settled in southern part of Southeast Asia. So the southern part of Southeast Asia would be much more Burmese uh, and Indians in their racial char character. Uh, then the, another major group of immigrants, the Chinese. They came in the 5th and the 6th centuries AD. They had been coming, you know, even before that, but the major wave of Chinese immigrants in Southeast Asia in the 5th and the 6th centuries AD. And they settled in the northern part of uh, Southeast Asia. So that is, you know, like, uh, uh, because Southeast Asia in the northern part is so close to China. That's the reason uh, in the northern part you would have much more a Chinese uh, racially oriented group of people. And in the southeast, uh, in the southern, uh, much more the Indian uh, part of uh, the, in Southeast Asia. So that, that, that you know, uh, it, the two countries, India and China, in fact, characterized and uh, defined Southeast Asia so far religion is concerned, so for race is concerned in Southeast Asia. And the feature that we would, you know, repeat and talk about, and even today, you know, you really cannot talk of uh, Southeast Asia without talking about the Indian immigrants, the Indian influences, the Chinese immigrants, and the Chinese influences in Southeast Asia. And there is uh, no, nothing, uh, I mean, bad associated with it. And that's uh, one of the great things about Southeast Asia, having these two major civilizations, Chinese and Indian civilizations, you know, uh, in a uh, major part of Southeast Asia. Let's see further. The early kingdoms that were established uh, in Java, uh, which is in Indonesia, so that, uh, you know, the greatness of Java as it was in Indonesia, uh, it was the center of Mahayana Buddhism. We talked about this Mahayana and Nehayana and Theravada uh, Buddhism, so this became the center of Mahayana Buddhism, and especially under uh, an Indian-oriented uh, family or dynasty, the Selendra dynasty that ruled uh, Java in about uh, 8th century AD. Uh, this family constructed Buddhist temples in central Java and that you would see again and again how each kingdom would express itself in the religious art and architecture in different parts of Southeast Asia. All right. Uh, that religious construction or architecture would be a greatest monument called the Parabodur which was constructed between 750 to 780 A.D. Borobudur, uh, this, uh, this was a, and still is, a Buddhist mandala type of a cosmic plan made on the uh, Buddhist cosmic plan called mandala. It has a six square base terraces, three circular top platforms, 
and you can imagine when when you go closer to it then you can see it for for better uh, 1300 panels of buddha's life <laughs> you know it's amazing how they could do that also uh, borobudur panels you know they depict the javanese people in one and especially irrigation and hunting you know in their own lifestyle so borobudur in java that is the classic example of uh, the the greatness of a kingdom expressed in religious art and architecture uh, and that's uh, you know not really unique to southeast asia you have that almost everywhere uh, anytime there was a great kingdom and that king, great kingdom was associated with a major religion, that major religion was expressed in the kingdoms or the, the, uh, the yeah, in the kingdom's uh, architecture. For example, you know, the temple of Jerusalem, you know, the temple of uh, Somnath in India, Western India. Oh, for that reason, uh, you know, look at uh, all these great uh, you know, uh, cathedrals throughout Europe. These are religious, architectural, you know, major uh, expressions of the king or the kingdom that existed there. Uh, for that reason, look at, I mean, the Taj Mahal. You know, it's a mausoleum, a shrine, basically, of a king, I mean, of a queen uh, made by, you know, uh, her uh, husband, uh, the Taj Mahal, the most magnificent, I mean, beautiful, uh, religious expression in stone and marble, you know, in India. Similarly, uh, in different other places. However, when you get to China, though, you don't see that type of a religious expression except the Chinese, uh, you know, humble uh, uh, Confucian shrines. But you, there you see also, you know, the Great Wall of China, which was not so much religiously motivated, but the greatest religiously motivated the first you know, monuments were in Egypt, like the pyramids. These were made, you know, for religious purposes. So here also in Southeast Asia, if you have the most magnificent, you know, architectural design, that would be definitely the expression of either the Buddhist or the Hindu religion in terms of a Buddhist temple or a Hindu temple. And some of them were used by both, you know. So it's very difficult uh, to completely separate that this is Buddhist and this is uh, Hindu because at one or another time both went to the same place and in some places they still do, you know, going to the same place with the Buddhist and uh, the Hindus because Buddhism evolved out of Hinduism. Buddha, in the beginning, he was a Hindu person uh, in India, and so that's how there is a connection between Hinduism and Buddhism, just like there is connection between Christianity and Judaism. Okay, let's see further these uh, beautiful mansions, I mean, architectural designs, the Barabador. Hmm? I mean, it's a huge and big, you know, and all these uh, terraces right here, and then the circular, you know, terraces right there. This is just the uh, outside, uh, the Buddhist stupas that you have, you know, throughout the, the uh, structure. There's a little bit closer view of them. And I think the height you could tell from this gentleman, the, you know, the monk, the Buddhist monk that's standing here. Some of them would have, uh, you know, a little small statue of Buddha and some would have uh, like a few relics of Buddha in Borobudur. Uh, Jatakas, uh, which is, uh, you know, Buddha's uh, life stories, uh, how he was born, what he did, how he taught, uh, different, you know, life stories of Buddha, uh, which is, you know, like uh, any religious uh, leader. Uh, we want to know, you know, different uh, religious leaders, life stories. Uh, so there they are, and they are all depicted, you know, illustrated in stone uh, throughout Barabador. Some more pictures. Right? Yeah. So what, what do you have, uh, you know, in uh, most of these uh, places? Uh, would be uh, the uh, life story of Buddha. That's one. 
or something uh, in the Hindu system, you would have uh, the uh, story from different Hindu uh, Vedas or uh, the story of, uh, you know, um, Gita or from some, something from the greatest uh, epic, uh, Mahabharata would be depicted one god or another god doing one thing or another thing, you know, and or maybe some saint, you know, uh, good people, uh, religious people, you know, leaders, you know, doing one thing or another thing, and that would be the greatest decoration, not only in terms of how they made the shapes of human beings, I mean the sculpture, you know, of human beings and put it there utilizing different uh, material, uh, not mud, of course, but mostly stone you know, and how they use that stone uh, to come up with these uh, beautiful, you know, uh, sculpture. And so th that's how this religious expression of the great thing kingdoms, you know, uh, produced these beautiful uh, architectural designs and monuments. Let's see some more. The Buddhist uh, Selendra dynasty, that rule, you know, mostly in the 8th and 9th century. Uh, that was replaced by a uh, Hindu kingdom, the uh, Mataram Hindu kingdom. And that Mataram Hindu kingdom was established by the Hindu Sanjaya dynasty, much more a uh, 9th century, 10th century AD from 852 928 AD. Also Mataram Hindu kingdom after the uh, Sanjaya dynasty, you see the rise of another Hindu dynast dynasty, Asiana dynasty. So first the Sanjaya dynasty and then the Asiana dynasty. And these dynasties, the Hindu dynasty would give rise to uh, Hindu temples in different parts of uh, Java or Indonesia. Here. Uh, the Hindu Prambanan temple made around 850 AD. I mean, look at the size of it. I mean, so magnificent. Uh, it's just unbelievable, you know. And religion, as I said, uh, was used in the rise of these magnificent structures. The Hindu Prambanan temple in 850 AD is another view of the same uh, beautiful, you know, towers, so to speak. And there's one all by itself pictured, just unbelievable. Uh, so these, uh, the, Hind the uh, Hindu structures, uh, again, uh, whether it's Buddhist or Hindu, uh, when you see it in Southeast Asia, Although both Hinduism and, uh, you know, uh, Buddhism, uh, they were Indian uh, immigrant religions, so to speak, into Southeast Asia. But the architectural or the, uh, the uh, artistic expression of the Hindu and Buddhist in Southeast Asia had the Southeast Asian signature on it. So you can never say that this thing was really done in India and completely imported from India in, uh, you know, in its total complete. Uh, that's not true. Uh, the Southeast Asian uh, Hindu and Buddhist uh, architectural designs, the temples, they have their own signature. They do not look like completely Indian, uh, you know, Hindu or Buddhist because the people of Southeast Asia, they knew how to express uh, their religious sentiments, their spirituality into stone and what to make of it. And that's why the Southeast Asian Buddhist and Hindu uh, structures are completely unique to Southeast Asia. Just like, uh, you know, a structure would be unique to China and then to India or f then to Egypt. Similarly, in the Southeast Asian masons and workers uh, and engineers, the designers, they had their own signature on uh, Buddhist and uh, Hindu architectural designs. Let's see some further. We're talking still of the early kingdoms. The one Khmer kingdom in Cambodia moving out of Java, uh, founded by 
although it sound like uh, you know a completely hindu person but don't be uh, surprised that uh, yes you know his uh, forefathers i mean uh, predecessors came from india uh, jayavarman the second founded by jayavarman the second in 9th century ad the kimmer kingdom in cambodia and he was a hindu prince from java in fact uh, he was driven out of java there was some trouble you know at home so he went to cambodia and united the kimmer people in cambodia and named the kingdom as cambodia which is the modern name of cambodia so the modern name cambodia is derived from cambodia that was created by the jayavarman second dynasty the hindu dynasty all right and this family jayavarman dynasty uh, in fact his dynasty uh, selected angkor as the capital of his uh, kimmer kingdom now angkor the capital of uh, you know a, 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 again it's so much religious as anything else and as we would see it uh, let's see further the uh, angkor capital that angkor wat uh, temple in cambodia built by king uh, surya varman second 12th century person 1113 to 1150 is just unbelievable i mean it doesn't see but there you, you can see him a little bit better that's his uh, you know uh, sculpture uh, he dedicated the temple angkor wat to the hindu god vishnu and for that reason he attracted more and more hindus you know as pilgrims to the great temple from throughout southeast asia as well as from india just like uh, today you know people go on pilgrimage to different parts of uh, you know christian would go to uh, or catholics would go to you know uh, vatican or rome muslims would go to you know mecca medina in saudi arabia jewish people might go to you know jerusalem and so here uh, i mean uh, in angkor uh, wat could attract a lot of hindus from throughout south south asia as well as southeast asia let's see further okay. here is at angkor wat vishnu god the hindu god churning the ocean of milk how is that to have a whole ocean of milk this is the model of angkor wat and this is the entrance to it okay, it's a model and so fabulous so famous that it became you know part of the cambodian flag so that's what you see this is the cambodian flag and this is the angkor wat uh, you know gracing the flag of cambodia a very early photograph 1866 photograph of one part of the uh, angkor wat i like it you know it's a old picture it tells you how good the technology back then was uh, you know this the beginning of uh, camera technology okay. this is almost the same place but you can also see how far technology has uh, you know uh, covered or improved uh, let's see okay uh, angkor wat uh, coming under you know trouble uh, the charms th this is another group of people uh they invaded the kemers devastated the kemers temple at angkor wat in 1177 uh the kemers moved the capital from angkor wat to another angkor thom another place uh and there they built you know a new temple in 1290 uh so they built a new temple which unfortunately you know a uh, the thai group of people destroy the kimmer kingdom in 1300 now 
this one uh, being uh, like, uh, you know, what you see from here onward, uh, I did not mention it, I should have. Uh, as you come closer to 1200, 1250, 1276, uh, unfortunately, uh, people in, uh, you know, uh, Cambodia or even down south, you know, they came under the heavy bombardment of uh, the Mongol people who by that time had taken almost entire China, you know, and the Mongols under, especially under the leadership of Kublai Khan, they had established, you know, their kingdom in China and they wanted to take over not only Korea and Japan, which they failed, but they also wanted to take over entire Southeast Asia, which was so close to home in South of China. Uh, why they were so much determined to take Southeast Asia, these uh, uh, Mongols uh, who are now ruling China, uh, one reason was they believed that they, this was the greatest place for all the food and fruits that one could imagine, you know, in life. So that was the, the great resources of Southeast Asia, in fact, attracted Kublai Khan and the Mongol leaders to take Southeast Asia. That was one. Another reason was some of these kingdoms had very peaceful relationship with Chinese, although there were disturbances between, you know, Southeast Asian, uh, especially mainland Southeast Asian and Southern Chinese problems. But by that time, uh, I mean 1100 and 1200, the relationship was peaceful in which the different kings of Southeast Asia, especially from mainland Southeast Asia, closer to China, they would go and visit the Chinese emperor. And when they would go and visit the Chinese emperor, they would take their own foods, fruits, or some gifts, like a tribute, as the Chinese would call it. Of course, sometimes gold, sometimes, you know, much more expensive uh, stuff. They would take it to the Chinese, and of course, the Chinese emperor then would give them better and more precious uh, gifts in return because the Chinese emperor wanted to establish his greatness upon the people of Southeast Asia. So in return, he would give them better gifts, much more expensive gifts and more gifts, and they would come back home, you know, happy. So this would keep the relationship between the two very good. <laughs> and so now the Mongols wanted the same thing the same tribute, the same acknowledgement of the greatness of the Mongol in China. And Southeast Asian people like almost telling them, you know, you are not Chinese, uh, you are Mongols and we're not going to submit to you or recognize you as our lords or as our rulers. And hence they started the fighting between the two. So from about 1250, 1260, 1270, uh, what you see Mongols coming and invading different parts of Southeast Asia, but it was again in Southeast Asia, in this part of Asia, I mean Asia, that the Mongols suffered a lot. Uh, in Japan, they suffered at the hands of the typhoons, you know, the kamikaze great winds that they didn't have any knowledge of, and so that would wipe them. In Southeast Asia, the amazing thing was all these little tiny mosquitoes that would give them fever, cause them to become sick, you know, different bugs, and, and that, that would, you know, drive them out of Southeast Asia. And of course, the people also, you know, would stand up to them. And uh, so the Southeast Asian people saved themselves from the Mongol invasions and Mongol overlordship or Mongol rule. But however, these Mongol invasions, just like they, you know, not conquered, but weakened the Kamakura Shogunate, Similarly, in Southeast Asia, the Mongols, they weakened one group of people or another group of people and made it possible, you know, for another or a third or a fourth group waiting in the wings to come and take it over after the Mongols weakened the existing kingdom. And that's what you see the Cham people coming and, you know, uh, finishing the Khmer people and then the Thai group of people with the spelling T-A-I. Uh, when we say TAI, that is, of course, the people of Thailand, uh, which now we call it Thai, T-H-A-I. But that when we say Thai, Thai, by Thai mean, we mean the older original group of the Thai people. So this particular group of people, they were also waiting in the wings, you know, who could not compete, who could not dominate the Khmer people, 
but once the Mongol weakened the Khmer people, then the Thai people emerged. And in fact, uh, some historians believe that the rise of the uh, uh, the rise of Thailand as a kingdom, uh, as a nation, that was due to the Mongol invasions, uh, who wiped out the previously powerful kingdom that existed in Southeast Asia, and made it possible for the Thai people to rise as a nation and to build their own kingdom in Southeast Asia, in Thailand. So that's what happened to the Khmer people in about 1300. Uh, the Thai group of people, they destroyed them. And as I said, the Thai is the same group that uh, uh, the uh, people of Thailand, they trace themselves to uh, as their ethnicity, to the Thai people. Uh, they, they, they seek inspiration from the Thai people saying that, you know, these were our original forefathers and that's how we need it. All right. Uh, there is Angkor Thom in Cambodia, not too many, but still there's a major figure there, right there, and the producer, you know, thanks to him, he said he, nobody could see it clearly, so he made it prominently with all the might of that figure that he is there. Okay. Uh, now, some uh, characteristics of the Southeast Asian people. Uh, by 1300 AD, Southeast Asia had gone under the process of what is called the Indonization and the Sinusization of Southeast Asia, which means that by 1300 AD, uh, Southeast Asia had been, uh, you know, had already absorbed uh, major influences, especially racial and religious influences from South, uh, from India and China. So that's what's called the Indianization and Sinusization of Southeast Asia. Most uh, Chinese immigrants that could come, most Indian immigrants that could come and settle in Southeast Asia, they brought their culture, they brought their languages, they brought their art, architecture, and particularly uh, religion. Uh, especially Buddhism and Hinduism to Southeast Asia. Now think about it, if they, Chinese and uh, Indian could come, I mean the rest of the people from outside, they were not too far away. And so this process would continue up to about 16th century. Let's see further. So keep in mind the Indian and the Chinese character of Southeast Asia. In fact, that is why it's called Southeast Asia because Southeast Asia is to the south of China, which is East Asia, and Southeast Asia is to the east of India, which is South India. So not to confuse you, it's called Southeast Asia because it is to the south of China and to the east of India. And unique style of art, sculpture, and architecture that Southeast Asia got from both India and China two major, you know, religions, Hinduism and Buddhism from India and Confucianism from China and becoming part and parcel of the Southeast Asian culture. It is because of Confucianism, Buddhism and Hinduism, in fact, that the Southeast Asian culture is very family oriented. You know, that's the, that's the major reason. Uh, for the Southeast Asian uh, culture to be very family oriented because of Confucianism, Buddhism and Hinduism, that is one. Another thing is, although Buddhism and Hinduism could not stop fightings and even massacres uh, in India and China, and sometimes they did become a cause, you know, Buddhism and Hinduism did become causes for warfare. Uh, but in Southeast Asia, somehow, they spread more peace. They made people more peaceful. They, and that could be, again, you know, the nature of the people in Southeast Asia, that religion would not make them fight. The difference of a religion would not make them fight, even though, you know, these religion, they did cause fighting in India and China or became part and parcel of uh, the fighting or the warfare. But in Southeast Asia, the good thing was that they preach much more uh, peace. 
And that would be like, a, you know, if any nation uh, would become more peaceful outside the Middle East, a Muslim nation, a Jewish nation, or a Christian nation would be more peaceful outside the Middle East than compared to, you know, Middle East being the birthplace of Islam, Christianity, and Judaism, uh, and that place is full of, I mean, trouble, you know, but these religions spread peace outside uh, the Middle East, and that's what happened also to Buddhism and Hinduism. At birthplace in India, they could be part of the friction and the problem, but in Southeast Asia, they became good, peaceful solutions for the people of Southeast Asia. So that's a big, big difference, you know, for these religions to be in Southeast Asia. Let's see further. Also, with Hinduism, Buddhism, and Confucianism came writing. And it, by 1300, writing became very widespread in Southeast Asia. They also attracted, by that reason, more outside influences. So by 1300, don't ever think that the Indians and the Chinese were the only one that would come to Southeast Asia, uh, which means that from 1300, uh, you just go into 1400 and you would see it. More and more people from outside would come, especially from Africa and Arabia first. And the Arabs, just like the Indians and the Chinese brought their religions to, and influences to Southeast Asia, similarly the Arabs, they would come as merchants, traders, and businessmen, but they would also bring their own religion, Islam and spread it among the people of Southeast Asia, and that is a reason that Islam is predominant in Southeast Asia. One of the major, you know, religions in Southeast Asia, to the extent that uh, Indonesia is the largest Muslim country in the Islamic world. And you, you could say that's just demography. Yes, demography, but to think about it, you know, more people accepting Islam in Southeast Asia than in any other place. So that's, a, you know, that's what I'm talking about, these influences coming from outside. And the Indonesian, Malaysian, or as they call it, the Southeast Asian Islam is much more mellow Islam, is Islam that would not make you to fight. Uh, very peaceful, you know, and because it, it became part of the peaceful already coexistent that was there in Southeast Asia, just like Hinduism and Buddhism much more peaceful in Southeast Asia. Similarly, Islam very peaceful in Southeast Asia. So after the coming of Islam, you see the rise of another or the coming of another major religion from outside, this one being brought by the Europeans. Uh, mostly Catholicism, you know, by the Portuguese and by the Spanish, and that Catholicism or uh, Christianity uh, spreading into uh, Philippines, uh, above, you know, north of uh, Mindanao in uh, especially Luzon. And so that's why today, just like Indonesia is a major uh, Islamic country in the Islamic world, uh, Philippines is the major Catholic Christian country in Asia, outside Europe, you know, and so it's because the outsiders, they brought this religion, Islam and uh, Catholicism to the people of Southeast Asia. Uh, Catholicism could, you know, create crusades, huge, big, massive warfare, you know, in Europe could ignite, I mean, blow up, I mean, kingdoms, but again, Catholicism in Philippines did not create that type of a crusading, uh, you know, spirit among the people of Philippines. So there also you see, I would say, Catholicism or Christianity much more peaceful when it came to Southeast Asia, just like Islam and Buddhism and Hinduism did not create. I mean, these religions live south by, side by side, very in very close vicinity. Uh, there should have been, you know, much more friction, problem, massacres, but it did not happen. So the, there is much more a peaceful coexistence of races and religions in Southeast Asia, and that makes Southeast Asia, uh, gives Southeast Asia a unique character to the people and to the place of Southeast Asia. Let's see uh, what we did today. 
in terms of conclusion. Uh, we talked about the geography of Southeast Asia being the mainland and uh, island Southeast Asia and different uh, uh, you know countries in mainland and Southeast Asia. Then uh, the different ethnic groups uh, in uh, Southeast Asia that uh, you know the, the indigenous people, the indigenous people and the Malay group as I said you know the major group and then of course the immigrants from uh, you know Burma, China and India. The Indian and the Chinese influences very predominant in Southeast Asia in fact you know that uh, characterize Southeast Asia. So that's how Southeast Asia is very much defined by the Indian and the Chinese influences. Also we talked about uh, you know the Hindu and the Buddhist art, religious art and how these great kingdoms, uh, although we didn't talk uh, much about them, but still how these great kingdoms, they uh, produced uh, the great temple, temples and the art and architecture there, much more the re religious expression of these kingdoms. Uh, rather than having, you know, the statues of wonderful kings and their families, that is so much you know part of the European art you don't have that much in Southeast Asia it would be always the Hindu gods and Buddha and the life stories of the Hindu gods and Buddha in the art and architecture and the sculpture of Southeast Asia so it is very religious in nature uh, that art and architecture expressed you know in Borobudur and Angkor Wat the two major religious expression of art in Southeast Asia. And also how Southeast Asia attracted different people, you know, uh, over the centuries from different places, as I said, from India, from China, from Africa, and also uh, from Arabia, uh, and later on from Europe, but also uh, closer to home. Uh, the Polynesian group of people. Uh, there is uh, now a lot of research going on in terms of the linguistics, in terms of the race mixing up, how the people of Southeast Asia also became sort of a bridge between the Polynesian people, how they contacted the Polynesian people. They got, you know, the seafaring techniques from the Polynesian people and much more the interaction between the two group of people and how the Southeast Asian languages had their influence on the languages of the Polynesian people, how they contributed to the overall culture or the seafaring culture of the Polynesian people. So if you look at uh, Southeast Asia, depending on how you look at it, but if you put on the map Southeast Asia in the middle, it is a very, uh, you know, like a unique central a point between different nations that they had to go, you know, through Southeast Asia and hence uh, on their way they, you know, took something from Southeast Asia in terms of the language, in terms of uh, the uh, technology that already existed as Southeast Asia. Most of it is, uh, you know, uh, maritime Southeast Asia, basically dealing with the ocean, all these nations dealing with the ocean and ocean being a major part uh, of Southeast Asia. Uh, rice and fish, you know, these are the staples of Southeast Asia and how these technologies, they gave it to other people and how they attracted other nations, uh, not just the Chinese and the Indians, but the Arabs, Africans, and later on in the 16th century, how they attracted the European people who brought, you know, their technologies with colonization, Catholicism coming, you know, to Philippines basically and to uh, some other uh, places uh, in Southeast Asia. So this was the Southeast Asia geography and people, art and architecture that we talked about today. Uh, next time, uh, hopefully we will wrap it up and uh, we will talk in a general way of, uh, um, we would see a general view of uh, Asia, what's, what we did so far. And so see you then. Thank you very much for tuning in. Aloha.